Good evening, everybody. Tonight we begin our study in Jeremiah chapter 46, and we're beginning a brand new section of the book of Jeremiah, obviously here towards the end. Let me show you what I mean. Let's read the first two verses of Jeremiah chapter 46. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the nations, against Egypt, concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates and Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now notice how it begins here in verse 1. We read, the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the nations. This begins a section that will continue all the way through Jeremiah chapter 51, where Jeremiah pronounces judgment against different nations. Now, you're aware that almost all the previous section in the book of Jeremiah, from chapter 45 all the way back through chapter 1, has mostly dealt with the kingdom of Judah. That's been the main focus of it. But God is concerned for more than just the nation of Judah. God is concerned for more than just the Jewish people. God has a concern for all the nations, and here in this section towards the end, we find prophecies given against the nations that surround Judah and that are on God's heart. God is going to pronounce judgment against the nations surrounding Judah, beginning with Egypt. And it's an important reminder for us that even though the book of Jeremiah deals mostly with the judgment God would bring against Judah... God did not neglect, God did not ignore the Gentile nations that surrounded Judah. He would also righteously judge them. Now there's a principle here that we just need to touch on upon this. The idea is simply being this, is that in the ancient world they had the idea of the local deity. Uh, Judah had its God. Egypt had its gods. Babylon had its gods. Syria had its gods, on and on and on. E each individual tribe or nation or kingdom had their own particular local deities. Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, wants to make it very clear, he's not one of these local deities. He's the God of the whole earth. And so he doesn't only have agency or, or sovereignty over Judah and the people of Israel. Yahweh is God over all the earth. So just as much as he can have a special focus upon his chosen people, the Jewish people, the kingdom of Judah, so he also has every right and authority to speak to the nations as a whole. I like what Philip Ryken said on this point. He said this, God knows who he is. He's not a regional supervisor. He's not a tribal deity. He is the God of all nations. His sovereignty is not limited to a single culture, nation, or ethnic group. Amen to that. And that's what's demonstrated in the section we're going to take a look at this week and the following week. Now, verse 2 begins against Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 46 describes the judgment that would come upon Egypt. One by one, Jeremiah is going to deal with various nations. And I don't particularly know why it's been arranged in this order, why he deals with this nation first, then the next nation, then the next one. But he begins with Egypt. Now, it especially deals with Egypt in this period when at the Battle of Carchemish, the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians. This is when Jeremiah gave the prophecy when this battle was yet in the future. We read about it here in verse 2. Concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. When that battle was still in the future, Jeremiah gave this prophecy. Now, Carchemish is an important historical place. It's at the junction of the rivers Chebar and the Euphrates in modern-day Syria and Turkey, right on the border area there. It's the only great city in the area, and just because of geography and because of layout, it was the key to that whole area, and that's where it was destined that the armies of Egypt and the armies of Babylon would meet together in battle. Now, um, this happened, again, verse 2 says, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. It actually happened in 605 B.C. That's when the Egyptians were overwhelmed at Carchemish. Now, again, this is what I understand. Jeremiah uttered this prophecy before that battle, but it was about the battle. So let's get into the prophecy itself, starting now at verse 3. 
Order the buckler and the shield and draw near to battle. Harness the horses and mount up you horsemen. Stand forth with your helmets, polish the spears, put on armor. Why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? The mighty ones are beaten down. They have speedily fled and did not look back, for fear was all around, says the Lord. Now notice this. In verse 3, this begins a section that is prophetic, but it's also poetic. And in this strong poetic slash prophetic imagery, Jeremiah is going to describe the scene and the atmosphere and everything regarding this tremendous battle at Carchemish, which was a terrible defeat for the Egyptians. That's why he says in verse 3, draw near to the battle. He puts the listener or the reader right there at the scene of battle. The armor is prepared. He says, order the buckler and the shield. The mounted soldiers are making themselves ready. They harness their horses. But then he asks in verse 5, why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? You see, the scene is that the battle is over as soon as it begins. Oh, the Egyptians go through all these elaborate procedures to make themselves ready for battle. But then, boom, the battle is over in an instant. And the Egyptians are on to defeat. Verse 5 says, their mighty ones are beaten down and they've speedily bled. And they fled, I should say, in verse 5. And don't look back for fear was all around. This is a full retreat of the Egyptian army before the Babylonians. Continuing on now, verse 6. Do not let the swift flee away, nor the mighty ones escape. They will stumble and fall toward the north by the Euphrates. Who is this coming up like a flood whose waters move like the rivers? Egypt rises up like a flood and its waters move like the rivers. And he says, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. Verse 6, he says, do not let the swift flee away. In his prophetic vision, Jeremiah could see the captains of the Babylonian army calling out orders commanding their soldiers to go out and to flee, every, uh, flee after every Egyptian soldier. In verse 8, he says, Egypt rises up like a flood. Now, this battle of Carchemish was held by the Euphrates River. And when the Euphrates River flooded, it could bring incredible destruction. Egypt came to battle like an army that would crush its opponents, saying, verse 8, I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. But it didn't happen that way. They came up with pride and with confidence that they would win, but they themselves were defeated. And now in verse 9, it's beginning to talk about how proud Egypt was destroyed. Come up, O horses, and rage, O chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans who handle the shield and the Lydians who handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. The sword shall devour, it shall be satiated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God hosts a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. So again, verse 9, God's calling to the Egyptian army, come up, O horses, rage, O chariots. And then he speaks in verse 9 to the Ethiopians and the Libyans who handle the shields. The idea is there is like many ancient armies, the Egyptian army was not made up of only Egyptians, but also of different mercenaries or slaves that they had brought in from other nations to be part of their army. But they're all going to come to ruin. Notice what it says in verse 10. This is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance. God called the arrogant and proud Egyptians to come to Carchemish so he could show that he was the God of hosts, that it was his day of vengeance. Now, I want you to spend just a little bit of time looking at that phrase, the day of the Lord God of hosts. The phrase, the day of the Lord, in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10 it's a good example of the principle that that phrase, the day of the Lord, does not necessarily refer, number one, to one single day, nor does it necessarily refer to the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom on this earth. It can refer to any time or season when God's might is manifest, especially in his judgment against arrogant opposition. It's a day, notice it says it right there in verse 10 very clearly, when he may avenge himself on his adversaries. Why? Verse 10, for the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. 
the defeated Egyptian army would please God the way that a sacrifice unto him would please him. It would be a demonstration of his own judgment against the nations. Continuing on now, verse 11. Go up to Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain you will use many medicines. You shall not be cured. The nations have heard of your shame, and your cry has filled the land. For the mighty man has stumbled against the mighty. They have both fallen together. You, you see, when the Egyptian army suffered such a great defeat at, Gilead, at Carchemish, they retreated southward towards Egypt, and they came through the promised land. They came through the region of Gilead. But they would not be brought to healing and strength there. Verse 11 says, In vain they shall use many medicines. You shall not be cured. And their shame, as verse 12 says, would be manifested before all the nations. Now, as a result of this, ultimately, Babylon would dominate over Egypt. And that's what we get into starting at verse 13. The word that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would come and strike the land of Egypt. Declare in Egypt and proclaim in Migdal, proclaim in Noth and in Taphanes. Say, stand fast and prepare yourselves for the sword devours all around you. Why are your valiant men swept away? They did not stand because the Lord drove them away. He made them fail. Yes, one fell upon another and they said, arise, let us go back to our own people and to the land of our nativity from the oppressing sword. They cried there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He has passed by the appointed time. Now notice verse 13 says that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, would come and strike the land of Egypt. Many years after the victory at Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar again sent his army, and this time they went all the way to Egypt themselves. And when that would happen, this is what Jeremiah sees prophetically. He sees the people of Egypt preparing for this confrontation with the Babylonians. They say, verse 14, stand fast and prepare yourselves for the sword devours all around you. But again, it wasn't only the power of the Babylonians that they had to fear, but verse 15 says, because the Lord drove them away. Please remember this, friends. We're not just talking about clashes between nations. We're not just talking about a battle between empires. Oh, you got the Babylonian Empire over here and the Egyptian Empire over there and they're going to clash. No, the Lord is in this. God is guiding history. And God was using this to bring a significant judgment upon proud Egypt. So much so that look at what they say in verse 17. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. The idea there is that he's all noise. He, he's noise but no action. He's talk but no strength. Everyone be able to see that Pharaoh was no longer a ruler of great power and authority. Now verse 18. As I live, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely as Tabor is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so he shall come. O oh, you daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity, for Noph shall be waste and desolate without inhabitant. Egypt is a very pretty heifer, but destruction comes. It comes from the north. Also her mercenaries are in her midst like fat bulls, for they are also turned back. They have fled away together. They did not stand. Going on, he says, For the day of their calamity had come upon them, the time of their punishment. Her noise shall go out like a serpent, for they shall march with an army and come against her with axes like those who chop wood. They shall be cut down her forest, says the Lord, though it cannot be searched because they are innumerable and more numerous than grasshoppers. The daughter of Egypt shall be ashamed. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says... Behold, I will bring punishment upon Ammon of No and Pharaoh in Egypt and all their gods and kings and Pharaoh and those who trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of his servants. Afterward, it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, says the Lord. Now again, this is very much familiar with the themes we've seen before in this prophecy. It's repeated for emphasis. In verse 18, God says, As I live, says the king, in the very strongest terms, God declares that this judgment would come upon the Egyptians from the hand of the Babylonians. 
Matter of fact, in verse 20, he uses a very vivid image. He says, Egypt is a very pretty heifer. You know what a heifer is, don't you? It's a young cow. And Egypt proudly thought of herself as strong and great and beautiful. And a matter of fact, that young cow, that young heifer, was very prominent in Egypt's idea of their national deity. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, what did they worship? A golden calf, a pretty heifer like this. God says, no, 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 Egypt is like a pretty heifer that will be sacrificed unto me. They would be cut down like a forest. They would be sacrificed like a pretty heifer. Verse 23, why? Because they are innumerable. This is the army that would come against them and it would bring punishment upon the cities and the rulers of Egypt. Yet in verse 26, there is a remarkable mention that I do not want you to miss. In verse 26, it says, afterward, it shall be inhabited as in the days of old. Do you know what this means? This means that God promised he would punish Egypt, but not destroy them. I'll punish you. I'll correct you. I'll bring discipline against you, but I will not destroy you. Now, I want you to think about that. Because there are other nations or kingdoms in antiquity that God did destroy. You're not going to find a Moabite today. You're not going to find an Edomite today. There are other nations and kingdoms that are gone. The Philistines, gone forever. But God promised, no, I won't destroy Egypt. I will bring correction against them. He gave a promise of restoration even to Egypt. Now, having mentioned the promise of restoration, now God's going to speak some comfort to his people. Look at verse 27. But do not fear, O my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you, for I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but I will not make a complete end of you. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. Now, God ended that section against the Egyptians. We're not done with the Egyptians. But he ended that section against the Egyptians with a faint promise of hope. I'm not going to destroy you. I'll correct you, but I won't destroy you. And it's if God says, if I'm parsoning out hope to any people, I want to make sure Israel gets lots of hope as well. That's why he says in verse 27, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, You see, after the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and Judah, the small remnant remaining in the land was afraid of the continued Babylonian presence, and they felt that they would be safer in Egypt. God wanted them, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, I will restore you. And I love the words here. Look at verse 27. He says, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of captivity. God promised to end the captivity of his people in Babylon, allowing them to return to the land, and it would be fulfilled. Jacob shall return and have rest, according to verse 27. But then look at verse 28. I am with you, Jeremiah says, for I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you. God sent his people to exile in judgment because of their great sin against him. But he would not forget his righteous judgment around the surrounding nations, and he promised to restore Israel in the midst of it all. Look, look, here's the simple principle. If Egypt had a promise of restoration, how much more Israel? If the Egyptians, as messed up and pagan as they were, if they had a promise of restoration, how much more the people of God? Friends, look, let's be honest here. These chapters of Jeremiah are tough. These are a muddy slog through judgment upon the nations. This week and next week, you're going to get a lot of judgment. But what we see is in the midst of this mud of judgment, it's like a landslide coming down at La Conchita. This landslide of judgment coming down. In the midst of it, we see 
glimmers of hope and restoration that look all the more beautiful because they're set in the midst of the darkness of the judgment. That's how beautiful it is. Do, do you think that God's going to give some kind of promise to, of restoration to Egypt, but not to Israel? Or how about this? But not to you. Do you really believe it? Do you really believe in the restoring power of God? Judah deserved judgment. They deserved exile. They deserved captivity. They had sinned with such a high hand against the Lord. But don't miss the point. They were nevertheless the people of God. And because they were the people of God, God would judge them. He would correct them. But then he would bring them back from exile and restore them. I wonder if I'm not speaking to somebody who feels that they have been under the severe correcting hand of God. And you wonder, will there ever be restoration for me? God says, yes, I am a God of restoration. Now, I can't tell you exactly what that restoration looks like. I suppose it could be different for different people in different circumstances. But don't miss the greater principle. If God's going to restore Egypt, how much more will he restore his own people? He says this, look at verse 28. take Take some comfort in this verse. But I will not make a complete end of you. God's judgment against the nations would be different than the correction of his people. Pagan empires and kingdoms might pass into history, but not Israel and not God's people today. He would, as verse 28 says, I'll rightly correct you. We value the correction of God, but we realize it's not the end of the story. No, he will not leave the people of God wholly unpunished. In other words, he'll correct them where they need correcting, but he also promises to restore. Let's take some comfort in that promise. Now, that's the end of chapter 46. Now we come into Jeremiah chapter 47, where he speaks a word of judgment against the Philistines. Are you ready for this? Here's the introduction in verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. Now, now you remember something about the Philistines. The Philistines were the longtime traditional enemies of Israel. Back in the days of David, in the days of Saul, in the days of the early kingdom, they always had to battle against the Philistines. You know yourself that Goliath was a Philistine, and they had this long rivalry. Well, even when the Philistines were subjected under David and his later kingdom, they were not eliminated. They were still there on the coastal region of Israel. So verse 1, when it says, against the Philistines, it begins a section where he will deal with the Philistines, the ancient enemies and rivals of Israel. Now look at verse 2. Thus says the Lord, behold, waters rise out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell within. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. At the noise of the stamping hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of the chariots, at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers will not look back for their children, lacking courage. Again, we have this section like we saw previously in chapter 46. Here in chapter 47, it continues with that poetic prophetic kind of thing where it's prophecy but it's set in sort of a poetic form very vivid but very filled with very much filled with imagery and that's why it says verse 2 waters will rise out of the north in other words the Babylonians would come to the Philistines and overwhelm them like a flood do you, do you know what a flood is now look let's face it here in California we don't have to deal with floods that much but there's been times there's been times when we had to deal with floods Look, it was long before my coming here to Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, but this building was flooded. This building was flooded with water coming up a foot or two. It was a severe flood many years ago when they had a big rainstorm and and different channels that take the waters to the ocean were backed up. It flooded in a big way. Here's the thing about a flood is you can't stop it. There's nothing you can do against it. What are you going to do? Just throw a couple sandbags down? Not with a big flood. When a river decides to flood in a significant way, there's nothing you can do to stop it. All you can do is try to protect against it. You can't stop the flood in the same way where it says here, verse 2, waters rise out of the north. There's no stopping this judgment of the Babylonians against the Philistines. That's why they say in verse 2, all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. Jeremiah described the sounds of conquest. 
The people are wailing, the horses with the stamping hooves, the rushing chariots, the rumbling wheels. Matter of fact, he puts this vivid note in verse 3. The fathers will not look back for their children, lacking courage. Jeremiah described the tragedy of the coming Babylonian invasion. It would bring such crisis and such fear that natural affection and courage would be forgotten. A father would be so desperate to save his own skin that he would leave his own children behind. And this is a terrible thing, a terrible description of the judgment. Now in verses 4 and 5, he's going to list the afflicted cities. He says, Because of the day that comes to plunder all the Philistines, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper who remains... For the Lord shall plunder the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? Notice verse 4 says that the Babylonian army had come to plunder all the Philistines. They would not spare the territory of these coastal peoples and acting as agents of the Lord, they would plunder them all. And then they start listing cities, including Tyre and Sidon. Now, friends, just to have your geography straight, Tyre and Sidon were not part of Philista. Tyre and Sidon were part of the Sidonian kingdom, the Phoenician kingdoms to the north, but they were in an alliance with the Philistines. And basically what they're saying is, you're not going to get any help from Tyre and Sidon. No, all your cities are going to go down. Gaza, Ashkelon, Kaftor, they're all going to go down. And and now, verse 6, notice this. Please take a look at verse 6. O you, sword of the Lord, how long until you're quiet? Put yourself up into your scabbard. Rest and be still. How can it be quiet seeing that the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore? There he has appointed it. Verses 6 and 7 are very interesting, captivating to me, form of poetic prophecy where Jeremiah speaks to the sword of the Lord. Can you picture the sword of the Lord, of course figuratively, but the instrument of God's judgment, and Jeremiah asks the sword of the Lord, I'm going to speak to the sword of the Lord. And what does he say? Oh, you sword of the Lord, how long until you're quiet? I see you, sword of the Lord, striking down the Philistines. I I see their desolation. I I see the fathers abandoning their children. How long are you going to do it? And look at the response here. Even though he says, put yourself back in your scabbard. Rest and be still. Take it easy on the judgment. No, look at how. Now the sword speaks. And what does it say? How can it be quiet? Seeing that the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore. God's sword of judgment would remain active until the work was completed. Now, when I read this, there's two thoughts that come to my mind. The first one is how little thought there is in our culture as a whole about the judgment of God. The idea of the sword of the Lord, an instrument of God's judgment, actually bringing a judgment against a people, it is so strange. It is so foreign to our thinking. Look, if people in our modern culture think about God at all, usually they only think about him as being some grandfatherly old man sitting up in heaven on a rocking chair, smiling upon everybody, except for some especially nasty people on the earth, those he frowns upon. Everybody else, you're good. But the idea that God may actually righteously judge, that there may be a sword of the Lord that will not turn back until it accomplishes what it intends? Friends, this is an idea completely separated from modern thinking. And it makes us liable for judgment. It makes us, it makes us unprepared for a judgment that may very well come. No, the sword of the Lord speaks and it says, I am doing God's business and I will not relent until it is finished. Now, there's another sense in which the sword of the Lord does its work. You know that the Bible, the word of God, is spoken of as a two-edged sword. This is the sword of the Lord, is it not? And it won't stop until it does its work among us. 
You can take this prayer that's actually a prayer about terrible judgment, and you can kind of shape it into a prayer for the work of God's Word in your life. Can you look at your Bible and say, Lord, this is your sword, this is your scalpel, this is your blade in my life. Do not stop until you've cut away everything you need to cut. Don't let it stop. Let it do its work in fullness. That's the idea of the sword of the Lord and the great judgment that came upon the Philistines. Now, um, he continues on here now in verse 48, or excuse me, chapter 48. Chapter 47 is a very short chapter against the Philistines and talking about the sword of the Lord. Now we come to our last chapter here for the evening, chapter 48, and it's a word of judgment against Moab. The the Moabites were a neighbor people to Israel. Let's read it here, the first five verses of the chapter. Against Moab, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Woe to Nebo, for it is plundered. Kirath Jamin is shamed and taken. The high stronghold is shamed and dismayed. No more praise of Moab. In Heshbon, they've devised evil against her. Come and let us cut her off as a nation. You also shall be cut down, O madmen. The sword shall pursue you. A voice of crying shall be from Honoram. Plunder him in great destruction. Moab is destroyed. Her little ones have caused a cry to be heard. For in the ascent of Luhith, they ascend continual weeping. For in the descent of Honoram, the enemies have heard a cry of destruction. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 48 is the judgment against Moab. We had Egypt in chapter 46, Philista in chapter 47. Now in chapter 48, God speaks his judgment against Moab. And Moab came as a neighbor on the eastern side and the south of Israel. Today it's modern-day Jordan. And the ancestor of Moab came from the incestuous pairing of Lot, the nephew of Abraham, with his daughters in the aftermath of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, Moab, the people of Moab, were something of a cousin to Israel. They feared Israel as Israel came from Egypt towards Canaan, and Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse Israel. Balaam himself was an Israelite, but he was hired by the king of Moab to bring a curse upon Israel. And there are some important Moabite people connected with the history of Israel. Most notably, Ruth was a Moabitess, and she was an ancestor of King David. King David had Moabite blood in his veins. Again, they were cousins to Israel. Sometimes there were friendly relationships. Sometimes there were adversarial relationships. Sometimes Moab had some dominance over Israel. Sometimes Israel put Moab under tribute to them. They were cousins who didn't always get along. Now God's going to speak to them in verse 1. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Again, just stop right there. Do you notice something here? The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is speaking to Moab. Could you forgive an ancient Moabitess for thinking like this? Um, Listen, uh, you're the God of Israel. You're not the God of Moab. Why don't you go speak to the Israelites? This is Moab. You're the God of Israel. You know what the God of Israel would say? You know what Yahweh would say in reply? I am the God of Moab. I am the God of all the earth. Your phony, baloney, Moabite gods, they're nothing. I am the only true and living God. Now again, let let me just make a note of practical application because these chapters of judgment are tough. We we look at this and we go, okay, judgment, judgment, judgment. Where's the practical application? Let me give you one right here. You got to recognize that God is God over everything. He is. Whether you recognize him as God over everything, that's another issue. But he is God over everything. The Moabite people may have said, we don't recognize Yahweh as God over us. Yahweh says, I don't care, I am God, and I'm going to pronounce judgment against you. Ladies and gentlemen, there may be an area that you are concealing from God. You're compartmentalizing in your life. You're saying, God, you don't have any authority over this. God does have authority over it. And the sooner you realize it, the sooner you're going to see God's blessing on that area of life instead of God acting as if he were an adversary. Well, he's acting as an adversary against the Moabites. 
He says in verse 1, Woe to Nebo, for it is plundered. Kirath Jerem is shamed and taken. Jeremiah began by listing the many major cities and places of Moab that would be overwhelmed in judgment, including the city of Nebo. He's not talking about the mountain of Nebo, but the city of Nebo. Kirath Jerem, Heshbon, Anuraram, Luath, they would all be, verse 1 says, plundered, shamed, cut down, and destroyed. Continuing on now to verse 6. Flee, save your lives, and be like the juniper in the wilderness. For because you have trusted in your works and in your treasures, you also shall be taken. And Chemosh shall go into captivity. Chemosh was the Moabite god. His priests and princes together, and the plunderer shall come against every city. No one shall escape. The valley also shall perish, and the plain shall be destroyed. As the Lord has spoken, give wings to Moab, that she may flee and get away, for her cities shall be desolate without anyone to dwell in them. (laughs) Judgment was coming against Moab, so what does the Lord of hosts, what does the God of Israel say to the Moabites? Verse 6, flee, save your lives. There's nothing you can do to stop this judgment. All you can do is react to it. And why did it come? Did you notice that line in verse 7 when I read it? Look at verse 7 again. Because you have trusted in your works and your treasures. Now Moab was a wealthy kingdom because of the trade routes that ran through it. And because of those trade routes, they could impose taxes and tolls and they made money from the trades and all that stuff. They were wealthy and they had great treasures and they trusted in those things. Those treasures made them proud and self-reliant. Those treasures made them ripe for God's judgment. You know, I think about it. I I think about it in my own personal life and I think about it in the lives of people I know. I think about it in our congregation. I I, I, I want you to be prosperous. I want you to enjoy the blessings of God and and, and succeed materially and and, and find your way to financial and personal success. I I want that for you. I I want it to be good for you in that area and not bad. But please note this. If you trust in your works and in your treasures, they will become a curse to you instead of a blessing. Oh, what a difficult thing it is to have good works before God and to have treasures that come from blessings upon God's people, but not to put your trust in them. Isn't that a word for us? Isn't that a word for Santa Barbara? You're blessed. You you have material abundance. Praise the Lord for it. Don't feel guilty about it, but don't you dare trust in them and let God work into your heart and your life a true spirit of generosity that will show that you do not trust in those things. Matter of fact, not only would their treasures be taken captive, look at verse 7, Chemosh shall go forth into captivity. Chemosh was the ancient god of the Moabites and sometimes used as a representation of the people. In their conquest, the Babylonians would take the literal idols of Chemosh and the people of Chemosh away into captivity. Matter of fact, all they could do is flee. Verse 9, give wings to Moab that she may flee and get away. There's nothing they could do to stop the Babylonians coming against them. Verse 10, cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs. And has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste has remained in him, and his scent has not changed. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I shall send him wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break his bottles. Moab shall be ashamed of Chemosh, as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, their confidence. Oh, please Look with me. First at verse 10 where it says, Cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. In other words, God's saying, he's speaking to the Babylonians. Don't you spare in the judgment that I'm using you to bring against the people of Moab. Don't you hold back. This is not a time for holding back. It's a time for pressing in and fulfilling everything that God wants you to fulfill. But then look at verse 11. And look at this carefully with me. It says, Moab has been at ease from its youth. Because of their geography, 
which gave them some natural defenses. And because of their wealth and affluence, Moab was at ease from his youth. God spoke through Jeremiah a remarkable picture of Moab's sin and condition. They had been at ease for a long time and they had settled on their dregs. Now, I I don't blame you for a moment saying, what does that possibly mean? Settled on their dregs? What's that? Well, the picture is taken from the ancient process of refining wine. You see, after fermentation, wine would be put into a jar or a bottle, and the impurities in the wine, the dregs, would settle on on the bottom of the jar. It would be something like coffee grounds at the bottom of a cup. Then, after a period of time, you would carefully pour the wine from one vessel to another, being careful to leave the dregs on the bottom and not transfer them to the other vessel. And then you might do it again a few times so that each time you left some dregs on the bottom of the vessel and you carefully poured it out to make the wine more and more pure every time you poured it. Doing this a few times made wine with fewer impurities to spoil the taste. Now, what had happened with Moab? Look at it there in verse 11. They had not been emptied from vessel to vessel. (laughs) Here's the picture. Moab hadn't been shaken up in a while, and it spoiled them. Moab hadn't been emptied. They hadn't been poured out. And so the flavor of the impurity, the dregs on the bottom, began to permeate through the whole thing, and it made them undrinkable. It made them not in a good place. I was going to say it's awkward phrasing, but you get the picture there. You see, the remaining dregs began to flavor and spoil the wine, so to speak. Moab would have been benefited from having been emptied from vessel to vessel, and for them, the big pour out was about to come when they would go into captivity. I'll put it in as simple words as I can think of. Moab was ripe for a great big judgment because they'd never been shook up in smaller ways, poured from vessel to vessel. Now, let me speak to you right now, especially any of you who might be going through a particular trial or difficulty right now. Isn't it possible that this is you right here? God is pouring you from vessel to vessel. You don't like the pouring process. You don't like being emptied out from one place and into another place. You don't like the purification work that God is doing. But you see what happens if he doesn't do it? If he doesn't do it, you settle on the dregs and then things have to be really shaken up. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a gift of God's grace when he shakes up our life from time to time. And do not regard it as a sign of his displeasure. Moab's problem was that they hadn't been poured poured from vessel to vessel in times past. If they had been poured, they wouldn't need this big catastrophic judgment. Is God pouring you out? Is he emptying you right now and filling you into another vessel? Is it an uncomfortable shakeup? Look for the gracious hand of God in doing it. He's doing it so that he can bring a purification in your life. Now, here's my only exhortation to you. Learn from this season. Don't let it go to waste. If you let it go to waste, then you might have to go through the exact same pouring process. But no, we want to become more and more pure as God empties us from vessel to vessel. There's a a classic book about a famous missionary, Hudson Taylor, the man who founded the China Inland Mission and was an amazing man used of God. He has a chapter in this book, Hudson Taylor, The Early Years. Here's the chapter title, Emptied from Vessel to Vessel. And he describes in that time a period in his life which was very unsettled. It was as if he was being poured from vessel to vessel, but how God used it to bring a strength and a purity into his life that was the result of great fruitfulness later on. No, don't despise it. Because if God doesn't shake you up from time to time, if he doesn't pour you from vessel to vessel, look what happens in verse 11. Therefore his taste remained in him and his scent has not changed. 
The picture remains true. If we are not emptied from time to time, we never grow and our scent does not change. God promised to send wine workers to Moab who would tip him over and empty his vessels. And Moab, at the end of it all, verse 13, would be ashamed of their pagan gods, ashamed of Chemosh. Continuing on now to verse 14. How can you say, we are mighty and strong men for the war? Moab has plundered and gone up from her cities. Her chosen men have gone down to the slaughter, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. The calamity of Moab is near at hand, and his affliction comes quickly. Excuse me, let me turn my page here. Bemoan him, all you who are around him, all you who know his name. Say how the strong staff is broken, the beautiful rod. You see, look at the arrogance of Moab in their pride. Verse 14, we are mighty and strong men for the war. This was the attitude of Moab. God would bring them low. And instead, as verse 17 says, they would say how the strong staff is broken. And look at the complete nature of the conquest of Moab, starting now at verse 18. O daughter inhabiting Dibon, come down from your glory and sit in thirst. For the plunderer of Moab has come against you. He has destroyed your strongholds. O inhabitant of Aor, stand by the way and watch. Ask him who flees and her who escapes. Say, what has happened? Moab is shamed for he has broken down. Wail and cry. Tell it in Arnon for Moab is plundered. And judgment has come on the plain country, on Helon and Jazra and Mephipha and Dibon and Nebo and beth Dirabahim and on kirath Jerem and Beth-Gamul and Beth-Meron and Kirath and Bozra on all the cities of the land of Moab far or near. Again, here he's just describing the different places, both cities and regions of Moab. The judgment was going to come upon all of them. Now again, verse 25, it's going to begin speaking about the reason for the judgment, coming back to the pride of Moab. The horn of Moab is cut off, and his arm is broken, says the Lord. Make him drunk, because he has exalted himself against the Lord. Moab shall wallow in his vomit, and he shall also be in derision. For was not Israel a derision to you? Was he found among themes? For whenever you speak of him, you shake your head in scorn, you who dwell in Moab. Leave the cities and dwell in the rock and be like the dove which makes her nest in the sides of the cave's mouth. Notice what God says there in verse 25, that the horn of Moab is cut off and his arm is broken. You know, the horn and the arm were representations of strength and might. And God says, I'm going to humble them. I'm going to bring them low. Matter of fact, verse 26, he says, make him drunk because he exalted himself against the Lord. Proud Moab believed that they were greater than Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. And they also believed that they were greater than Israel. They exalted themselves above Israel and they held the covenant people of God in derision When things went badly for them, God promised to bring judgment upon them. Moab would wallow in their own vomit. And just as they laughed against Israel when they experienced judgment, so other nations would hold Moab in derision. They would mock him like you mock the guy who's writhing around in his own drunken vomit. Verse 29. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud of his loftiness and arrogance and pride and of the haughtiness of his heart. I know his wrath, says the Lord, but it is not right. His lies have made nothing right. Therefore, I will wail for Moab and I will cry out for all Moab. I will mourn for the men of Kir Harris, O vine of Sibma. I will weep for you with the weeping of Jazir. Your plants have gone over the sea. They reach out to the sea of Jazir. The plunderer has fallen on your summer fruit and your vineyards. Joy and gladness are taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. I have caused wine to fail from the wine press. No one will tread with joyous shouting, not joyous shouting. From the cry of Heshbon to Eliah and Jahaz, They have uttered their voice from Zoar to Honorarium like a three-year-old heifer for the waters of Nimrin shall be desolate. Moreover, says the Lord, I will cause to cease in Moab 
the one who offers sacrifices in the high places and burns incense to his God. You see, God knew the pride. He knew the anger. And he was going to bring judgment against Moab. So much so that in verse 33, joy and gladness are taken from the plentiful field. In their previous section, they enjoyed the produce from the field and the wine press, but all of it would be taken away. Now, nobody should think that Israel or the people of God should take joy over another nation's destruction. So look at this now at verse 36. Therefore, my heart shall wail like flutes for Moab, and like flutes my heart shall wail for the men of Kir hear us. Therefore, the riches they have required have perished, for every head shall be bald and every beard clipped, and on the hands shall be cuts and on the loins sackcloth, a general lamentation on all the housetops of Moab and in its streets. For I have broken Moab like a vessel in which I have no pleasure, says the Lord. They shall wail how she is broken down, how Moab has turned her back with shame. So Moab shall be a derision and a dismay to all those about her. For thus says the Lord, Behold, one shall fly like an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. Kirioth is taken and the strongholds are surprised. The mighty men's hearts in Moab on that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. And Moab shall be destroyed as a people because he exalted himself against the Lord. Again, there's no joy over the fall of Moab. Verse 36 says, my heart shall wail like flutes for Moab. But God says that he would bring the judgment. Did you see the image in verse 38? I have broken Moab like a vessel in which I have no pleasure. You know, back in those days, earthenware, pottery, was cheaply made and easily discarded. When you didn't like a pot or when it became cracked, you just threw it away. God says, this no longer pleases me. I will discard the Moabites. And verse 42 makes the remarkable claim, Moab shall be destroyed as a people. And friends, they are. Matter of fact, it didn't happen very long after this because they exalted themselves against the Lord. It happened in about 582 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar marched against Moab and Abnon and not long after that, the Arab people moved in to take over the area of Moab and Moab as an independent nation of Moabites was pretty much obliterated. Now to the end of the chapter and the end of our study tonight. Verse 43. Fear and the pit and the snare shall be upon you, O inhabitant of Moab, says the Lord. He who flees from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who gets out of the pit shall be caught in the snare, for upon Moab, upon it I will bring the year of their punishment, says the Lord. Those who fled stood in the shadow of Heshbon because of exhaustion, but a fire shall come out of Heshbon, a flame from the midst of Sihon, and shall devour the brow of Moab, the crown of the head of the sons of the tumult. Woe to you, O Moab! The people of Chemosh perish, for your sons have been taken captive and your daughters captive. Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab in the latter days, says the Lord. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. Let's conclude with a look at two quick things. Number one, Notice the unrelenting nature of God's judgment. Did you see that description in verse 43? Fear and the pit and the snare shall be upon you. You're not going to escape. It says, he who gets out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. In other words, there's something unrelenting about the judgment of God. And friends, I just have a simple exhortation for you. If you will not escape the judgment of God by putting your trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, what hope do you have of escaping it? It is unrelenting. You, you go from the pit, you're going to fall in the snare. You go from the snare, you're going to fall in the fire. It's unrelenting. You cannot escape the judgment of God except by putting your trust in Jesus who is judged for you. And if you have put your trust in Jesus, you should praise God right now that you are spared this unrelenting judgment of God. Sometimes I think we take it too casually. Yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved from God's judgment. Do you realize how wonderful that is? Because there's no other possibility for you to be rescued from that unrelenting judgment except in Jesus Christ. Secondly and finally, notice God's promise 
Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab. Now, I'll be honest with you. We don't know how this was fulfilled. Maybe it was fulfilled by people with Moabite heritage who was no longer in the kingdom of Moab because the kingdom of Moab was destroyed and scattered. But that genetic line still persists somewhere in the world. Maybe it's through those people eventually coming to faith in Jesus Christ and being restored in him. God's offer of rescue from judgment still goes out to the nations. We can escape his judgment by putting our trust in Jesus. 